that technique. That again is another workshop. But um, a few things that we can talk about and I think you need to be aware of is just issues of alignment. So that the basically, I don't know if you could, I guess I need to put my stuff down. So that, that this is level, you're not like this and you're not like this. I see a lot of this kind of playing, it, which is just so, so difficult. And you're just using your fingers. Basically, we want to be free in the wrists and joints moving like this often in circular motions and at angles not just like this up and down that's part of developing artistry is having fluidity at the keyboard and moving in 3d space joints releasing of the joints the wrist and the elbows are so often locked yeah so that is another thing to be aware of fingering is crucial of it often for success of a passage and um, I often consider redistribution um, dividing things between the hands or taking one note um, in, in another hand uh, I have no shame but in Opus 111 doing this instead of I've missed this so many times this way I don't yeah, so not that you're going to probably be having students playing Beethoven Opus 111, but I just use it as an example. For students, I think it's so helpful if they're teachers, if we can show them. So the more you can demonstrate um, a physical and a musical concept, I think that is worth a thousand words. Yes, so I strongly encourage that. The, aware, the awareness issue of students is critical here and that the students hear what they're doing. No artistry can be present if a student is not um, hearing and listening critically. So I recommend having a student, once they've played a passage or a piece, have them critique it for you. Say, what did you think went well? What could have been better? And it's interesting, you learn a lot from what they say as to what they're getting and what they're not getting. And then I also like to use sometimes uh, the method of playing back to a student what I heard them play. And, it, and it's surprising then that they can hear it when they hear you do it. They can't necessarily hear it when they're doing it because they're so caught up in the doing. Uh, but that can also be a really helpful technique and I'll just say this is what I heard you play and then I'll say so what did you what did you think uh, what could be better and then they'll they'll usually get it they'll usually be able to identify uh, the issue lastly it's invaluable to have students record their lessons uh, hopefully many of you already do that but um, in a lesson so much information is conveyed and this way, the student, the onus isn't on the student to remember everything right at the lesson. And so they can listen back to the lesson, and I strongly encourage them to take notes, to actually write down, either in a notebook or on the music itself, the technical and musical issues that were, that were discussed. And the writing of it just helps. It gets it in the brain. Yeah? So, any questions on, on, the, on those things that I covered? I mean, I, th I think, I imagine a lot of, the, of what I'm saying you already do. Um, and so hopefully this is just a validation. And if not, then it's food for thought. And you're certainly welcome to say, he's crazy. You know, that's, <laughs> and I, I might be crazy, but. Um, so if anyone um, wants to ask a question, they can just yeah. unmute for a second. You can also write any questions in the chat. And if you don't know where the chat is, if you see your control screen, it's right in the middle. And uh, you can chat that. And then at, at little pauses, um, then we can look at those or bring them to Dr. Otten's attention. And I want to apologize to everybody. I forgot to press record right at the beginning. So I didn't get the introduction. But I have um, much of what you've said so far. And <laughs> thank you. Great. All right. Well, then let's move into the next page of the handout, which is elements of uh, artistry. 
I would say one of the main things that need to be present is a sense of having line of the of this of music moving in a horizontal rather than a vertical fashion we of course we're pushing down keys yes so we're already at a disadvantage so we have to liberate ourselves from that downward tyranny if you will and so developing the ear so that we are listening through the initial attack of a note because what happens you, you play a note and it immediately starts to die yeah so we have to train our students to listen to that uh, to listen to that decay and especially when people are playing loud it's interesting you know you can just hear them they'll listen very nicely you know to the softer things, but they start playing loudly and it's just bam, bam, bam. You just get one attacked chord after another. And so listening past that initial attack, particularly in louder playing, and feeling a connection from one chord or sound to the next, particularly in louder playing, is, is crucial, I think. And along with this, the idea of connecting every sound with the ear, particularly the silences. So often we get to a silence and it's like we go out to lunch. It's like, okay, no need to do anything right now. It's, it's a rest, it's a silence. Ah, but that's where true artistry lies, you know, is in how you listen. So the silence isn't a dead space, but it's just, it's an inhalation, perhaps, or an exhalation. Often thinking in terms of breathing, uh, I, I use a lot of analogies with singing because I actually studied singing myself when I was uh, injured and gave art song recitals. I actually sang Dichter Liebe before I ever played it, which is crazy, but it was an amazing experience. And uh, I think we as pianists, and apologies if, um, I, I'm assuming everybody here is a pianist, but I know Roseanne teaches violin. Uh, and if they're non-pianists, I welcome you. I bow to you. You're wonderful. Um, but to understand how breathing works um, and how silence works um, is so important. And singers really, really understand this because they have to breathe. Yeah. And we as pianists can learn a lot from that. Um, and that's a big part of artistry the issue of timing and where to take time and where to breathe. It's, uh, the next issue, attending to multiple elements simultaneously is super important. And this involves what I call being <laughs> sort of present in the sense of simultaneity. So you hear what you ju what's just happened you hear and evaluate what's happening while you're playing and you're thinking about what's going to happen. So past, present, and future are all happening at the same time. And this, this is actually a, a very profound spiritual concept. We won't get into that right now. Um, <laughs> that's a whole other discussion, but it's important for artistry, yeah, because you have to be present in all these different ways and attending not to just, oh, I'm gonna voice my top, oh, and I need to clear my pedal, but oh, I need to voice my top and clear my pedal and have a sense of direction and put a little bit of timing, a little bit of breath before the note that I'm voicing my top on, all that has to happen at the same time. And, and, and that takes training, yeah? And so here's the thing, we have to decide as teachers how much are we willing to and can we push our students? They will rise to the level that we ask. So if we as teachers are happy that the students are pushing down the right notes yeah, uh, and getting the right rhythms, that's what you'll get. And to me, well, that's the very beginning. That's the, that's, that's the skeleton of the, of the music. Artistry is fleshing it out making it come alive with all these different elements that, uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. That takes dedication. 
that takes, and that's art, yeah? We live in a culture, unfortunately, excuse me, I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a moment, where people are rewarded for simply showing up. They're, they are given superior ratings for getting through a piece. I find this to be absurd. This is why I will not ever adjudicate something where they want me to give out superiors, because I say, I'm sorry, probably I might give out one or two, but there's no way that I will give out 20 because there just aren't going to be 20 superior performances in terms of what my standard is for superior, you know, where this is really outstanding and all of these elements are checked off, you know, a beautiful sound, great sense of direction, great sense of style, pedaling was amazing. That's superior to me, you know. So we have to make a decision as to how far we can and will engage our students. I have found that any student can attend to listening, they can learn how to listen, can learn how to shape, can learn how to play with a beautiful tone, how to, how to use pedaling. But you have to start um, with appropriate repertoire that they can handle these things. All right, left hand, yes. So often, um, you can simply get a, a higher level of artistry out of somebody by just telling them, listen to your left hand. We're so right hand focused. We're, 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 we're so concerned about, you know, all the beautiful things we do in our right hand, but often it's the marriage of the two hands that really, really makes, makes, it, uh, makes it special. The whole issue of sound, this is, I, I think, a huge topic and another uh, topic unto itself uh, for a workshop. But your sound is your calling card, yeah? And that's certainly the case for a singer. Um, so you want it to be as varied as possible. And the key here is hearing in the inner ear before you play what type of sound that you want to get. So this is what I call being proactive. Yeah, being reactive is, is you, you, you play and then you're like, oh, okay, I, 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 that was maybe too much left hand and oh, I needed a little bit more top. Proactive is, I think of it before I actually do it. And, and then I just drop all my, all my uh, pages on the floor, excuse me. Uh, so that's a very different way of approaching something. Um, we do want to, of course, evaluate what we do always, but we want to be proactive in terms of knowing what we want before we do it. So the whole issue of a beautiful core sound, um, particularly in playing melodies, this is so often lacking um, in, in students, you know, so that, that you have, just so and D flat nocturne, a uh, singing tone in your melody. So often it's really a matter of just upping the dynamic in the melody line one notch. And that means if you see piano, marking of piano in a passage, you immediately have to play mezzo forte in your melody. Yeah? So piano dynamic equals mezzo forte melody and pianissimo accompaniment. You know, if I'm going... Completely horrible, right? No artistry at all. And this is so often the case, is that we get uh, students playing the accompaniments as loudly as the melody. How often have we heard that, right? Just... takes a lot of control. The classical repertoire, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Clementi, all that stuff, is not easy at all. <laughs> I mean, to control those left hands takes a lot of skill, yeah? And we as teachers have to show the students how to do it, but more importantly, how to listen for it, to be even aware of the fact, yeah? The issue of, of playing loudly 
too is an important one so that so that if, as soon as we lock our wrists the, sa the sound is a, 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 is an attack it's not a pleasant sound but if i but whoops i'm on the wrong pedal if i if i free my wrist even with a sharp attack it's very different yeah so we have to be very aware of what we do physically and what we teach our students about physical movement has a huge impact on the kind of sound that they get. I lost so many competitions because I had just a, a, an ear splitting sound in high school because I didn't know, I didn't know how to do this, how to drop the weight yeah, and release. So, so, so everything was like, was, was pressed. Yeah, and, and pushing through the key once you land, as supposed to once you land in the key, you don't keep pushing. You use minimal pressure. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to get into technique issues, but there are a few key concepts that, we, that one really has to talk about. This next one, speed of key descent, is crucial for artistry. And that is the slower the descent into the key, as in the slower the key goes down, notice how if I slide on the key, it changes the attack. Now if I do that with a quick, even when I'm playing softly, bum, bum, there's a rhythmic quality to it. So if you want a warm melodic tone, you either you use your drop, you drop into the key using weight, yes, and you don't push with a tight wrist, and, and you don't play down quickly into the key, because that will give you all these little, let me see. See, I, I was pushing and I was playing very quickly into all those melody notes. I don't know if it's coming across on Zoom, um, but it, it should have sounded like uh, 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 as opposed to which hopefully is much more linear. So this issue of key descent, speed of key descent is crucial, yes? Variety of touch, which I just talked about, yeah, using using the drop. This is what changed my life when Alita True taught me how to drop. I swear to God, I won every competition I entered, every single one, my senior year, because I knew how to use my weight. I wasn't even, yeah, my previous teacher, Yolanda Novik, was a wonderful teacher and opened my eyes to so many of these things that we're talking about but she never taught me that. Crucial, crucial point. Yeah. Seven pounds of weight. <laughs> Gotta know how to use it. Yeah. If it's locked up, then you know it works, it works great for um, for something where you want a lot of bite. That's Muchinsky, by the way, one of the preludes. Um, but not so well for Chopin. Or for anything that you want to have a lyrical, lyrical tone. Okay, inner voices and accompaniments. Oh my God. Again, along with the melody being, you know, a mezzo forte to a forte, your inner voices and accompaniments generally need to be much, 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 much softer. Do I make my point? <laughs> And again, so often that's the, that's the case. The beautiful Greek, Arietta. Which is so, so, I love this piece. I just think it's so wonderful. But if you do this. No magic. Yeah, where's, where's the song? Singers know this. Singers know that they have to sing basically around mezzo forte, yeah? Not much softer than piano. They let the pianists do the color. They do the really, really soft. Um, not to say that singers don't sing really, really soft. The great ones know how to do that. And the same thing with great pianists. 
but it's often a matter of proportion. So if a student is struggling with a softer dynamic, just up it. The dynamic police aren't going to come and arrest them or lock them up, or you for that matter, yeah? It's just a matter of figuring out the proportions and the scale. And, and so often problems are solved by just upping the dynamics one level, but you may, better make sure that you're not getting your accompaniment. Uh, I, I mean, those, as I say, those classical Alberti basses are just uh, killers. Voicing of chords, okay, is another thing. If, 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 we, just, if we just have, so the cathedral, No magic, because there was no top. You have to... Fifth finger of steel. Ha! Fifth finger. Yeah? So, and, and Nolita actually would, would have me do exercises with, like, working the fifth finger, you know. Um, just a few things, a few tips about voicing. So often, again, what we need on the top part of the chord is a, about a forte or a mezzo forte, just on the fifth, just on the fifth finger. So, I mean, the difference in pressure between what I'm doing on these lower notes and what I'm doing. See how it changes when I start bringing in too much left hand. That's the magic of, of the Impressionist repertoire, it is, is these floating textures. And we're going to look at the uh, first era of S. The only work, if, if all of the filigree, the background, is truly background and is filigree. Yeah? So with the, with the chords, same thing, that we really... I'm angling my hand to the side. I'm not playing, if I, if I play straight on, if I play straight on this way, it changes it. If I angle over, and you, I don't know if people can see that, this versus that. Then, it sh then it's easier to voice. A, a nice little exercise that you can have your students do is to play the top note as a grace note, and then the, and play it forte and the rest of the chord pianissimo. So for example, and then, and then finally, you know, so they're developing the awareness of that the hand is practically split in two. The top, yeah, where the weight is, where we're, where we're angling, fifth finger of steel or fourth or whatever, and then the rest of it, which is much, much softer. We're negotiating so many notes on the keyboard. If they're all equal, it's a mess. It's a train wreck. Who can sort that out? Yeah? So we, we have to know where to shine the light, as it were. Yeah? Putting the spotlight on that, on, on that top note. And the rest of it's in shadow. Look at the Impressionist painters, yeah? That's, uh, that's exactly what they, what they did. I don't know if I can... Uh, I, I have an Impressionist painting up, up here, and, and, the, and it's, it's very vibrant in the, in the gold, and then, and then the blues are, are much less so, and, and it, it draws your eye to a certain place, and it's the same thing that we want to do uh, when we're teaching our, uh, our students, is where... Do they, where's their ear going? And then if their ear goes a certain place, then they can bring out that line or diminish a certain line, yeah? So that is that control uh, of knowing that not all notes are equal and how do we do it? What do we do physically to facilitate that is crucial um, for artistry. Matching decay, oh my God, so, so, so important. I hear so many times that students do not do this. Um, and this was something 
again, that I learned from um, Nalita, which is as soon as it, the idea of that you play a note and it, it starts to immediately decay, so the next note that you play needs to be softer. Yeah? If you just do... Again, we get that vertical. It's just one attack after another. Yeah? So that's really, really critical uh, for artistry, particularly in uh, melodic lines. That we, you know, that Chopin, the next note better be soft. So it's not a huge mistake. Right off the bat, if you hear bum, ba -dum, ba -ba, you're sunk. Line's gone, there is no line. Yeah. And that's just training your students over and over. Say, are you listening? Did you bump? You know, because uh, it is, it's a bump. It's, and, and lines are not bumpy. <laughs> that's, that's spiky. We don't want spiky. We don't want spiky in our line. We don't want spiky in our rubato. Yeah, in our timing. So, because of this issue of decay, the longer notes, need more sound. So, in our Chopin example, that first note better have a good forte tone. If I start out, I've already backed myself into a corner. Where am I gonna go? Yeah, in terms of matching, very hard. But if I start out with a forte, then I can, then I have somewhere to go. So, very often, issues of line are solved by just giving more on the notes that are longer, yeah? And the shorter notes lead to them. And this is the same in terms of direction, which we'll get into more momentarily. Um, thinking orchestrally. The orchestra is such a great resource for us because the different colors that are available in an orchestra are what we want to imitate uh, on the piano. So having the sense of color, yeah, and that certain chords deserve special color. So if you're going major and then minor, giving it a special color, that already imbues a whole different sense to the proceedings. Yeah? Silence. The issue of silence is as important as the sound. Again, I, I talked about this earlier, that silence isn't a stopping point. It's not a resting place. Yeah? It's an absence of sound. And, you know, this is very Zen, but th there is great beauty in, in silence. A and students can definitely be taught that. How, you know, a fermata how to enjoy that and the, and the timing that you take. And if you engage, if, if, if you truly engage with that sound, then it's, it's like, you can even feel this in the audience, it's like time stops and it's magical. And, and, and audiences, they, they won't necessarily know what happened, the mechanics of it, but they can definitely feel it. And you can feel it in the room. So never underestimate the power and beauty and artistry of, of silence. And often we want to have our rests be a little bit longer even than what's on the page. Yeah? Um, so often uh, the issues that students have are clipping rests yeah, and, and coming off of longer notes too soon. So lengthening our longer notes, lengthening our rests. That just makes it sound artistic. If you clip, if you're off too soon, then you sound not artistic. <laughs> then you sound impatient. I know, because I have an impatient nature. So, <laughs> so I didn't learn how to do this stuff until I was much, much older. <laughs> so there, there, there is beauty in, in aging, absolutely. Um, you, you perceive time in a different way than you do when you're, when you're younger. And those of you who are... Uh, or sport in the gray like me, I think you probably can understand that. I know I couldn't when I was 20. You know, I just, I just want to play fast and loud, you know, so.
Now I want to play slow and pretty. <laughs> so the issue of flow and direction, so, so important. I so often will hear students, though, again, be playing the right notes, and they might have a nice sound, but there's no sense of where is the music going, yeah? And so often I'll say, do you want me to speak to you like this? Yeah, yeah, so that, that has A, no direction and no shape, right? It's robotic, yes. Great tool to use with students. They'll be like, what? You know, did I sound like that? <laughs> and then they're like, mm, yes, or no, not quite that bad. Also, I use the tool of exaggeration sometimes in playing some, some, something back and, and, and doing it really badly um, to exaggerate what the issue was. And I'll say, okay, it wasn't that bad, but you don't want it to get to that place that you just heard. But the issue of direction, um, avoiding a feeling of beat, 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 yeah, of being metronomic. This is why metronome practice, for all its help, can be detrimental to artistry, yeah, because not all beats are created equally. And the idea, and I re didn't remember to put this in, but write this down because it's so, um, so important, and now I completely lost what it was that I was going to say. Oh my God, I just set myself up. I'm having a senior moment. Oh crap, that's, that's, that, that's bad. Okay, it'll come, it'll come back to me because it was, it was like, I can't believe I forgot to put this in. Ah, it just came back to me. And, and that is feeling a larger pulse. Yes, so if a piece is in four, then you don't want to feel it in eight. And so often that's the case that students that you, you'll hear, I mean, like the Mozart. I feel every eighth. Yeah. But if you think, I'm you know, even feeling half note and do it's a larger framework upon which to hang the notes. And that can be liberating. And often if students are playing fast passages, you know, and they're just like really working, every beat, every beat is present. So often, again, instead of feeling every quarter note, you're feeling the line and you're feeling a much larger impulse. And the larger impulse is brought to you by feeling not such small rhythmic units. Yeah? So liberating ourselves from that, liberating ourselves from the bar line, for God's sake, the tyranny of the bar line. It's fantastic for organizing music on the page and making it all very nicely, nicely mathematical. But again, that's the skeleton. Yeah? In artistry, we transcend that. We have to go beyond the beat, beyond the bar line. Yeah? The idea that shorter notes move to longer ones, I think, is really important. So in the maple leaf rag, I'm, da, 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 I'm leading to there, and I'm lengthening, I'm lengthening the long note ever so slightly. Yeah, so I'm pushing. And I'm bringing out the syncopation. And then to there, dun, dun. that go to there was a big Nalita uh, phrase. Yeah, so that these have direction, not dun, bum, but to there. The rhythm actually compresses ever so slightly. Bum, 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 versus bum, 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 bum. That's math. That's not artistic. Yeah. So. That's why something, even like a rag, we can create so much more excitement and interest. We need to do this in 20th century, 21st century music all the time when, um, when we have syncopations bringing out, you know, syncopation. Pianistero Sonata, why am I on the middle pedal? That's because I'm talking to you like this. Much more exciting. I'm lengthening the long note, and I'm moving forward with the shorter note. Yeah? So short notes moving to long notes create 
so much more um, direction. Off beats lead to beats. Same thing. If so often, it's so easy to cure like you have something like that. Okay, that's bom, chong, 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 right? But if you think one, two, three, four, one, four, one, one, ta. So two leads to three, four leads to one. Or one, two, three, four, one, two, three. I'm grouping the rhythm. The rhythm is all mathematical, right? It's just quarter notes. But I put in little commas. One comma, two, three comma, four, one comma, da, da. Simple, but so important. So important. Ah, avoiding accents. Yes, there are pieces, of course, where you want to have your accents. But if you just start accenting beats, and so often students will do that, yeah, you'll get your... Because it feels good. Accents feel great. It grounds you in the music. Unfortunately, really bad for artistry. Yeah? <laughs> so, and even when we have accents, a series of accents, we can still shape them. Yeah? There's, a, there's hierarchy. We want to have a, develop a sense of hierarchy to our, uh, our accents. All right. <sighs> Rubato and timing. We're going to work with this with the participants, so I'm, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. Uh, I already mentioned that we don't want a spiky rubato, yeah, so it's not suddenly fast or suddenly slow. Uh, we want to vary our rubato. If you took time in one place and the parallel place comes up, maybe don't do it again. Or if you just had a rubato, you might not want to do one two beats later. <laughs> yeah, more isn't always better. So we, we have to we have to pick and we have to pick and choose. Um, Otherwise, the overall structure gets compromised and the unity of the piece falls apart. And it becomes a lot of really, really beautiful moments. Um, so it's just something, something to think about. Timing. So a large leap. Ta -dee, right? A singer would never go, -da! they wouldn't just smack up, up there to the top note. They would set and take time. I think string players do that as well. You just have to um, you set the note a little bit. At moments of climax, yeah? You don't want to just plow through. You want to actually uh, take some time for a climactic moment. There's resistance that's present in that. Um, the ends of phrases often need time. At the end of a section, before going into another section, breathing uh, before, just before going on. And we talked about special harmonies. Going from a major to a minor probably needs time. The arch structure, this is such a nice thing to do, particularly in romantic music, that little greed. So if you start slightly under tempo, you move through the middle of the phrase and take a little bit of time at the end, it works beautifully. So time, move, So we get this arch solves so many problems. This is just not expressive in uh, in the same way. So so often beginning a phrase with just a little bit of extra time can make it just sound infinitely more personal. All right. I want to talk about pedal because, as I said, I think this is a really important aspect of musicianship and artistry and so often is maligned, forgotten, and misused. That's why I do a workshop, pedal, uh, use it, don't abuse it. Ha ha ha. I know, so funny. Um, you have to think that this is a giant resonating box. 
it's going to sound better if you use pedal. So I'm using pedal on this note. I'm getting all the sympathetic resonance of all the other strings. Yeah? It's similar to like a vibrato that a string player or a singer would do. Yeah? I can play the same note, and you may not hear that on Zoom, but it doesn't have nearly the resonance and the color. Yeah? So my feeling is, and you are free to disagree with me, use pedal when you can. Use as much pedal when you can. That being said, the caveat is, in terms of stylistic considerations, you don't pedal Mozart like you do Chopin. Yeah? And the same thing goes for rubato and the type of sound you use. Every era has its specific requirements uh, in terms of these issues, which is why I included for your reading pleasure the handout on uh, on stylistic differences between eras that's a huge workshop um, that, that I do and there just isn't time to get into all of that and the specifics for this workshop but if you're interested I go through Baroque classical romantic impressionistic and I talk about sound timing um, pedal articulation and, and ornamentation and all those issues and how they change from era to era. Okay, that's part of artistry too. Yeah. Um, so if I hear a first arabesque, that's gorgeous, but it's not Debussy to me. That's way, way too free. Yeah way too much rubato, way too much soupy, slurpy, crescendo, diminuendo within a small uh, period, yeah? And this is where a lot of people make a lot of mistakes with French music, um, because it's just, that's not the style. That's Germanic. We, and I'm a German, okay, I get it. Yeah, we're all, you know, intense and, and all that. The French are more reserved. Yeah, ooh la la. Yeah, so none of so to play the first arabesque the way that I just did is 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 lovely, but not stylistically appropriate, not stylistically correct. I've jumped ahead to the issue of style, um, and and that is though I think an important consideration uh, for artistry as well. So. Just to talk about the different types of, of pedal um, very quickly. So the touch pedal, where I'm using my foot just to pedal each note. That's very different from one of my pet peeves. Forte, chord, forte staccato chords that are just, they sound like chickens, like scratching at something, as, a, as opposed to slight pedal, yeah? So that's the touch pedal. We can also use that just to connect one note to another momentarily in Bach. So we'll see that in the D minor symphonia. Um, the flutter pedal, that's the jiggly foot where your foot is like you're nervous, yes? And um, so we need that in that I'm, I'm doing this with my foot so the texture doesn't get get too thick. That is tricky. But again, if you're going for artistry to have, you gotta, you know, it's, it's an important tool to have in your toolbox, um, particularly if you're going to be playing French music. Finger pedal. So that's holding the notes down to create a pedal sound. It's very important in classical repertoire, yeah? But you're not actually using the, using the pedal to create all of that. Riding the pedal. That's just holding that sucker. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. There's a wonderful passage in the um, in the B flat minor nocturne. And it's just D flat major. You just hold the pedal. You can hold the pedal like, I don't know, it's three, four, five lines. 
This is all D flat major. Long pedals, riding the pedal though, and, and it's very soft things, is predicated upon making sure that that left hand is three Ps. Listen to hear what it sounds like if I don't. It's just annoying. So that's why people start to change the pedal often is because they don't have control of their texture. And so they instinctively want to change the pedal um, to, to help that, but resist that. Students also tend to want to change, like use the pedal like a metronome so that they change on every beat or every bar. And again, particularly in French music, that's just not appropriate. You know, in the, in the cathedral, it's, you have to hold. I mean, he has ties into infinity. That's the magic of the fact that all of that is ringing. And if you let go, you're starting over. You know, you're, you have just flushed that sound down the toilet. Bye-bye, it's gone. Yeah, that resonance, that magic. So, soft pedal. Please encourage your students to use it. <laughs> it's there for a reason. Unfortunately, on upright pianos, it doesn't tend to work very well, if, if at all. But on a grand, it does. And you get a real, you get a real shift on, in the sound. So, basically, for me, if I see pianissimo on the page, I probably use soft pedal. Yeah? Or I'll use it halfway down. It's a little trick. Yeah? If you have a melody that needs to project and sing, uh, perhaps a half, half soft pedal is the better way to go rather than full soft pedal, which can mute out the melody too much. Um, <clears throat> so, one another little trick, if you have pedal at the beginning of a piece, put the pedal down before you start. Yeah, so that you get all the resonance of the strings right, right, from, the, uh, right from the beginning. Let's see. I want to make sure we have time. Um, release. Pedal releases. <laughs> Somebody came up to me after a, uh, at a conference a few, and, and said, oh my god, the thing you, you talked about um, with the slow pedal release was so amazing. And she said, I, you know, that was just so incredible. So I'm going to share that with you. And that is... Uh, and this goes along with listening and an atmospheric close and listening to, to listening to decay. But which is if you if you have a very quiet close, you hold the pedal, then I take my fingers off. And then what I do is I very slowly lift the pedal and you get this amazing like expiration of the sound. It just expires as opposed to hold off. That's a rhythmic, what I call a quick rhythmic release. You know, you want a quick rhythmic release. Crowd's wrong, wrong pedal again is on the middle pedal. You know, at the end, at the end of the piece, if you, if you want, uh, if it's supposed to be explosive, yes? And again, not, um, you don't want to not use pedal for a last final chord. Yeah, again, that staccato fortissimo chord, use pedal. Um, but it's a very, very quick, abrupt release. But so working with that, with the slow release is really, really uh, magical. Ah, all right. One quick thing about articulation. This is so, so important. Um, the fact that different note lengths create different moods. So you want that staccato to be bright, crisp, and sharp. You know, you want that. That sounds terrible, right? Blah, 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 blah. It's like you're stuck in mud. Yeah, so that quick, sharp attack, yeah? Up for, for, up on the key, it's not. If I do that, it's a, it's a mess, yeah. Um, but
You don't want this. That's horrible, right? So not all staccato is created equal, particularly in Mozart. Yeah, so often people clip and just make their staccatos short as possible, regardless of the mood. Yeah, if you're if you're in a slow movement, and it's lyrical, you're not going to want to do a short staccato. Very different. So just being aware of. That I think is uh, is really really important. All right, so I powered through that. Before we start, so I just a few things in this in this first arabesque. So the idea of flow to there. So we're moving to there. Grouping across the B to there, to there. It's not da da. That's beats. Da 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 da. We want to avoid that. So I can maybe take a little time. Then last to there. Can you? Is it working? I I just did something that I know I can do in person, but I'm talking and playing at the same time. Is that? Does that work, or not? Susan, we can hear you. You can hear me. All right. It, I also want to say it's you're you're at the one hour just to give you a little time. Yes, yes. yes. No, I'm I'm very I'm I am very aware. <laughs> okay, okay. It's wonderful lecture. Thank you. Yeah. So, but just the idea of the the flow of the piece, the shaping. There's no little, but you want a little crescendo to get to that, then you want a little bit less. Then we hear to there. Notice the time. I set the downbeat. Then pianissimo, that means I really have to float. There can be no crescendo in this left hand. That will ruin it, yeah? If I do crescendo. So often students just, again, want to dig in to those busy left hands, particularly when they are rangy like that. Same thing in Chopin. It, it just makes us feel good to dig in. But it doesn't sound good. Alas and alack. Um, In measure 26, this is another spot. You don't want you want a mezzo forte on this, and then pianissimo for this, and you hold the pedal, and that's the Debussy sound. And same thing. I'm just completely. I'm playing actually non legato. If I, if I play, if I actually play legato in these inner things, same thing with this. Things that need to float often, you let the pedal do the connection, and and you release the notes so you don't keep putting pressure into the key. Just a little, a little trick. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the because this is so often a train wreck this middle section if you just apply what we talked about in terms of short notes moving to long notes lengthening long notes it fixes so much so we go go to there long and also long sound then we match to the long note extend breathe Go to there. Match. Voicing. That's like fortissimo up there. But this is about a piano. Yeah? Then I stretch. Because they're tenudos. But I don't go ba, ba, ba. Because that's metronomic. That's math. Right? 
to demand that of your students that they just don't play that way yeah you say, you say you broke the line to me breaking the line is worse than playing a wrong note we're also focused on wrong notes yeah but we should be focusing on on our line yeah and our sound and our listening so all right so that's my soapbox um, but you see how that so the other way Magic, no artistry there. Yeah. So, all right, that is the end now of my talking. <laughs> no, I will talk more, but in terms of talking at you, now we're going to be more uh, participatory. And I would say perhaps we should start with Megumi, since I know she needs to be gone by 11.30. And so, Susan, would you play the first half of that Clementi, the G major sonatina? Just, just the first half, just until the, the D major uh, cadence. And I will find the music. Thank you, Megumi. I, are, you, are, they, are you there? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, so Megumi, was that what you wanted? Would you, what would you do differently? Or what did you, so what did you like about what you did and what, what, what might you do differently? Um, what I would do differently, well, I, I think I need to make my, um, the long scales, I kind of need to make them smoother because they kind of get uneven, but right. I try to focus on dynamics a lot, like all the accents. Right. Okay. So a couple, couple of things. Um, it's Mark Presto. So I would say you had sort of an, an allegro going, but I wouldn't say it's quite presto. Can you play it faster? Have you ever tried it faster? Um, if I start playing it faster, I sometimes like lose, the, lose a, like a rhythm. Like I usually, I, like it starts kind of getting all messed up. Like the rhythm's not even. Okay. So, so that's going to be something to work towards. Yeah, so that you want to have about, because that's a very different feeling, yeah? 
so I was, and it's in, it's in cut time. Um, so, so because right now it feels like but I'm getting jump, bump, bump. With cut time though, we want almost like feeling one beat um, per measure. Could you, could you just try that? And, and another thing, what do you hear in my left hand? Sorry. Um, it's really smooth and kind of quieter. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's a really important part of this because right, what I was hearing was I was hearing that. So your left hand, and you've got three notes in your left hand to one in the right. So you definitely want to have that left hand be like half as loud as what you played. Can you just start that, get started again? And just with, with, think of your left hand as just being sparkly, really sparkly, but really, really, really quiet. Yeah, so it's totally in the background. So it's not competing with your right hand. Okay, so yeah. So that, that'll probably take some work. I would recommend that you practice maybe recording yourself and listening back, yeah? I'm guessing that, that you're kind of pushing. You want to think of all of this as being non-legato. Yep. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's not bomb, but you're not pushing into the key. Would you just try, try it with that idea of everything being detached? Not, not, not that you're bouncing like that, but that as soon as you play a note, you let go. Just the left. Tan. Just left, just left. Yeah, but, right, and then it has to be the same thing on all on all the other notes as well. So remember, folks, I said accompaniments in classical era are hard. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, what I I like the fact that you didn't um, you didn't do. Um, you didn't clip and you went you did you didn't go like that which so often um, we hear people do so good for you um, and here on the forte we want that shape so it's not it's not just all like that yeah um, and are you using any pedal? Um, not really. I, I mean, on the big notes, I use pedal. Good. Exactly. So we talked about that, uh, folks, the idea of you. So pedal, um, da -da -da, pedal, uh, pedal. I like a little touch of pedal there. Pedal. Pedal. Rock. Pedal. So there are places that you could add some pedal to uh, to help make make the sound more beautiful and a little bit more a little bit more connected. So just thinking about um, making this. There, there's a lot of short notes, right? So I would practice. Practice it legato once and then see because you might shape it differently if you play it legato rather than all staccato. Yeah, that can be a helpful, helpful tool because often when we play staccato, we don't listen past the shortness of the note. Okay. Um, do you have any questions for me? Um, I was um, about the trill. Ah. I, I, I usually trouble on trills. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was the one spot that was really a big problem because you went half tempo. Simple solution. So don't try to don't, don't try to do a fast trill. Do what I call a measured trill. So it would be just use pedal. Everybody hear what I'm doing? I'm just 
there's nothing to be gained from trying to do a fast trill if it slows down, yeah? I mean, so this is my feeling on uh, trills. Use measured trills if you have to. With, with ornaments in Baroque, leave them out if they don't work. You can't do that here, you have to do the trill. But often in Baroque music, people get all hung up on their ornaments. Yeah, you, you can change them, you can add them, and you can leave them out. Because ornaments should not detract, they should add to the experience. Okay, so that's what I would recommend for, for, for you there, yes? When you get this faster, then it'll sound like a real trill, because... It'll sound great. Yeah? You understand what I'm saying with that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. And thank you for mentioning the trill because I had wanted, that was like the big highlight thing that I wanted to bring up. And then I forgot because I got into all this other stuff. So thank you for, uh, for doing that, for bringing that point up. All right. So how about we have the Bach Symphonia now? Do you want recording or do you want um, my actual playing? The recording. So Susan, if you could uh, give okay. us the Bach. Okay, I don't have access to that. I guess, does Roseanne? Hold on, no, Susan, Roseanne? Susan should have I'm it. working on it, I'll have it Roseanne, shortly. I... <laughs> I've got it, just give me a sec. Oh, okay. cool. Here's this. You can follow along. Okay. switch with me a little bit? Yeah, you're on the hot seat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> masked person. It's, it's jo your joy, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> masked person. <laughs> it's Zorro. All right. So, um, I, I think, uh, Joy, I think your tempo that you take is I like the reflective quality. You know, Bach didn't give us any tempi or dynamics. So this is always the challenge in terms of what do we do? So I thought your, your choice and thank you. I liked the, notice she didn't go. She did not clip the staccato. They were detached, but they were gently detached. So I thought that was really nice in terms of the reflective character. 
that you that you brought to it, um, and and the tempo, which was also. I mean, it could have been. You could have made it more dance like, right? That would have been a lot harder to play <laughs> because you have to negotiate a, a lot of stuff in the voice texture. And I'm not saying that that would be something I would do. I think I would choose what you chose. But just to say, we have lots of options with this music and often Baroque music should sound dance-like because it's so often rooted in dance. Now, um, can you give me more? So what I felt was eighth, 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 eighth. So can you Mm, think about the larger pulse, the, instead of, a, of an eighth note pulse. So first of all that, and then what I heard was what would you change? Do you hear? I'm sorry? Bring the last note out the high notes. Is that what you're talking then? Bring that out more, maybe? Well, yes, you're doing that, but what happens after that? We want to, everybody, match. the fade. Yeah, da, da, da. Because you were doing consistently coming out of your long notes, I had accents. So that disrupted the line. So you want to go through all of this and, and make sure that you're really listening. Da -de -de -dum, bum, da -da -da -dum, bum, so that there are no accents following the tide notes. Okay? Oh, oh. And okay. the other thing is uh, the direction. Okay. Hold on. Is and go to there, right? Da -da -da -dum. So we're moving. Dum, bum, da -da -da -da. Do you hear how I'm slightly compressing the 16th? They're leading. Ba -da -da -dum, ba, then long. Da -da -de -dum, ba, ba -da -da -da. So like we suspend and then we fall out like a dancer. Suspend and then fall forward. Yeah? So remember we talked about that? Longer on the longer notes, we can extend our ties, extend our long notes. Short notes moving to long notes, the sixteenths are moving to the eighths. All right, so that combined with the matching uh, and the slightly, and, and the pulse, not being eighth note pulse. Yeah, so I've given you like three things here today. <laughs> but I think they'll really change how you approach the piece and how we hear the piece. You want to just try a little bit of that? Okay. Sure. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna stop you. Could you go through Yes. Right, yeah. So that there is, uh, even, even in a slower piece, there's a sense of dance. Ba da da dum, bum, ba da da dum, bum, ya da da di. Rather than, there's no sense of dance there. It's just a sense of step, step. You're stepping, 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 walking, rather than dancing. That's that's a that's a big shift, yeah. So that that'll take a little. You can even I would pra I would uh, sing it to yourself. Ba da da dum, ba da da dee dee dee, ba. Yeah, and 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 then get the feel. You can walk around the room. Ba da da dum, ba ba da da dum, ba. I know my head is cut off. Da da dee dee, ba. But you get the, you get the feeling of what I'm trying to do with this. Yeah. And thank you. You use some touch pedals in places where you had jumps and breaks, and you use the momentary pedal to connect. Good job. Yeah. I was, uh, the last thing is you did a little retard. I don't mind that. But then, give a, give a moment, 
don't go take the retard and then immediately a tempo. Yeah, remember, and you, you, you want this to be fluid and not spiky. So, along with not, don't accent the beginning. Yeah, so it's not ba da 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 ba. Anytime we have um, anything that's an offbeat entrance, we don't want to, to come in with an accent because you're accenting the wrong syllable. Otherwise, ba da da ba da da. Yeah, it's ba da 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 ba da da da. Okay, I liked, thank you, I liked very much your retard, that was so appropriate, and I liked the fact that you, da, 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 and you set, what I call setting, which is placing slightly late, you set the last note, and that was great, that was super, super appropriate. So, any, anything on, on your end? Uh, I had a day that day. I actually practiced it over, um, and I did there, and I don't know. And then I realized because I was thinking, oh, I need to pick up the tempo, but that's the editor's suggestion. Ah! Ah! So I, do you have? You keep cutting out, unfortunately. You keep cutting out, and so I can't hear everything that you're saying. You said Glenn Gould. So Glenn Gould <laughs> is a, it, I don't I use. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, uh -huh. so here's the thing. Editor's markings are, this is a, this uh, is a whole other rabbit hole we can go down, particularly for Baroque music, which is why I am not okay. in favor generally of editions that have editorial markings in Baroque because you think we start thinking this is the way it's supposed to be. It's an editor's suggestion. That's the beauty of Baroque music. You get to choose the tempo. You choose the articulation. You choose the dynamics within stylistic parameters. So what I'm saying is I think a slightly faster tempo would be helpful because you'll get more flow and it won't feel as plodding. Yeah. And then that's, so, but I appreciate you bringing up the editorial thing because that is a problem, yeah? So feel no compunction to do anything that the editor said. Okay. You can just forget it. <laughs> you have my, I'm gonna give you a note here. You have the note, virtually. <laughs> you have your permission slip. You may take, as I said, you can go. I would not, I mean, you could, you, but you still have to get the damn. So there's still that same feeling of flow and of, of the short notes moving to long. That doesn't change regardless of tempo. This is where people get stuck in slow music because they suddenly get metronomic, yeah? But there's still lilt, there's still flow, there's still direction. It's just harder, <laughs> it's just harder to do. All right, I'm sorry, we're gonna to need to move on, but thank you so much. All right, um, how about the Scarlatti Sonata and let's just have, um, well, it's short, we can, you can play the whole thing.
So, uh, is it Corinna? Is that how you say your name? Yeah, it's Corinna. Yeah. Good job. So this, I think this is a really, really good piece for you. You're, you're doing, so you're doing well with the, with the tempo. I think it's a good tempo. Have you thought about playing it maybe a little bit faster? Um, yeah, I think <laughs> the first recording I did was a bit faster, but um, I decided to play it a bit slower until I get Okay, yeah, as you get more comfortable with the piece, you know, it might... So also, so again, sometimes it feels a little bit like... Do you feel like you're feeling the eighth notes, Corinna, or do you feel like you're feeling a larger pulse, honestly? Um, I kind of feel like I'm feeling... Uh larger pulse sometimes. Okay. Well, try for that all the time. <laughs> yeah? Would you try just a little bit, just a little bit faster, and with that, you know, that you're going to there. So that the sixteenths are leading you to that long note. And think of that you're, this is very much a dance, a dancing piece. Can you imagine somebody dancing to this or you're, you dancing? Yeah. You had to think about that. <laughs> like, I'm not sure about that dancing thing. But it, it, to me, it very much has, has that, that quality to it. So the more you can think about dancing the piece, I think the better it'll be. Try, just try a little bit at the beginning with that dance feel. Right, that's so nice. I, I, I really, yeah. Does it feel, yeah, it, it might, it might feel a little scary on the repeated notes. Now, what I heard was this. I heard. Can you, t what happens at the beginning? Accent. Accent, yeah. Can you do it without that? It'll give us a better flow, a better line. If you go... So that you're growing the repeated notes rather than like... You know, you don't want to sound like a woodpecker. Not, not that you did. But you don't want to even be close to sounding like one. Oh, careful. That, that sounded a little woodpecker-like because you accented. When you go fast, yeah. Yes! Great! Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, Corinna, do you know what's going on here musically? I mean, structurally? We're repeating the same material, but it's at a higher level each time? Yeah, Roseanne, does she know what that is? You discussed that? Okay. All right, so it's a sequence, right? So whenever we have a sequence in Baroque music, in, in any music, we wanna make sure that we're not doing the same thing, yeah? So what do you think might work in terms of this sequence where it's going up? For each set, what would you do dynamically, maybe? Maybe have a crescendo. Yeah! You got it, exactly, yeah? So. That will, and you were already sort of doing that just now. Yeah, you're very quick. You pick up really quickly. Good for you. Um, now on your, so you did, you could do, you could make them a little faster. And if you do repeats, you could, um, or, you can add some ornaments on your on your on your repetitions. Do you do that already? Maybe. Um, I wasn't really sure what to do there because I was listening to different recordings and each one did it differently. Like some of them did it short, and some of them did it like really. And guess what? That means that you, and here's where you get into the thing and listening to recordings. Yeah, you'll hear all kinds of different things, and then you get to choose. <laughs> you get to choose what you think might work along with your teacher, yeah? 
Because here's the thing, Corinna, not everything that's up on a recording or on the internet is good or is the way you want to do it. So like Joy was talking about Glenn Gould, Glenn Gould's interpretations tend to be very eccentric. Sometimes it's almost like I feel like he's willfully doing something because he wants to do it differently than anybody else would do it. Which I don't think that's a great reason to do something, you know. Um, so, but what I'm saying is you don't have to do them the same every time. So that's why, you know, you could do, and then the next one, yeah, and then you can add a little ornament or you could add a trill. So that's, that's the beauty about um, having repetition too on the repeats. You can make it more elaborate. That's where I, I would maybe add in little, little ornaments. Yeah. Roseanne, have you talked with her about that at all yet? A little bit. Okay. Right. So the, the last thing I want to talk with you about, um, and then we're going to get to, to Mary Jack, is um, what, now what, beginning of the second half, Corinna, what happens right there? Um, I did a ground chord. Can you talk a little louder? It kind of, uh, it's a bit quieter, maybe, because it's like the repeated. Right, but musically, if you compare um, what... What's Scarlatti doing? He's just repeating, right? It's an exact repetition. Did you, were you aware of that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, you sound like you're not totally sure. Okay, that's important though. So whenever we are looking at a piece, we always want to know what sections repeat, particularly when they repeat right, and I'm not talking about a big repetition of the first page or the second page. I'm talking about like a little, then it repeats, right? So that means you have to do something different because if I say something to you the same way, if I say something to you the same way, and I repeat it, it doesn't mean anything. If I say something to you the same way, if I say something to you the same way, if I say something to you the same way, it better have meaning. I better change my emphasis. Otherwise, why do it again? So, what might you do on the second one? Uh, maybe make it a bit like quieter, maybe. Yeah! What we call that an echo, yes? And guess what? This is where, folks, we use our soft pedal. Yeah, beautiful use of soft pedal in the Baroque. So we just, soft pedal. Yeah, it's like a different register on the harpsichord or different registration, yeah? So you wanna make sure that, think about that, you know, and even, that's another, another sequence, right? So you're going to want to da, 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 da. you're going to want to make the second one a little bit more maybe because it's going up. It doesn't always have to be that way, but often it works that sequences that ascend that we can build them and sequences that are descending we can we can uh, get softer. Um, here when you have the, you could uh, like, did you hear what I did in the middle one? Um, yeah, you like decrescendo made it quieter. So I didn't know. actually decrescendo. I went ba da 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 dum bum ba da 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 dum bum ba. I made it suddenly softer. I did an echo in the middle. Yeah, that's terrace dynamics, right? Very appropriate in the Baroque. So ya da 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 dum bum ba da 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 dum bum ba da 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 da. So I'm jumping like from terraces from one place to another, dynamically. Super appropriate. You could do, what, what I heard you do was, I heard you do each one more. Good job, that works too, okay? But I'm just, maybe for your repetition, you know, when you do the second page again, you could do a different dynamic, okay? Also, don't be afraid to add, 
Add the low A for the octave, the totally okay, and then go. What am I doing? I'm rolling the chord. They always do that kind of stuff on the harpsichord. Scarlatti was a big show off. Yeah, he wrote these sonatas to show off his technique. Unfortunately, he got so fat when he was older that he couldn't, like he wrote a lot of pieces that have hand crossings and he like couldn't do it because he was so fat. So that was kind of too bad. <laughs> but this isn't a hand crossing piece, but it does have cool repeated notes, which a lot of, a lot of his sonatas have, have repeated notes. Thank you so much. Good job and good response. I had a question about... Oh, question. Okay, quick, quick. Yes. Like, at the beginning, do you think that I should start it, like, really flamboyant and, like, loud or graceful and... After what now? I didn't hear the first part. Uh, like, do you think I should, at the beginning... Like, at the beginning? Like, a big entrance, like, really flamboyant or a really soft... It could go either way. My feeling is you're starting out, I'd probably start out more flamboyantly. And then maybe on the repeat, you know, on the repeat when you come back, then maybe do a quieter. See, that's the cool part about the repeats is that you can do different dynamics and you can add ornaments and do it differently. So I have to tell, I, I'm just going to tell the story really, really quickly. When I was in a competition and I played some Bach, I generally try not to play Bach in competitions because everybody has their own interpretation. But one of the judges, I, and I did uh, the B-flat partita, and I did repeats on all the movements. And I, did, I didn't do anything different on the repeats. And the judge said, the reason to do repeats is to do something different. Totally boring. <laughs> Totally boring. So I was dismissed in my performance. Um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so that one stuck with me. So, so you, you certainly weren't totally boring, but you have room to, to do a lot more stuff. Okay. So thank you. Okay. So Mary Jack, um, we've got 15-ish minutes. So how do you want, how would you like to use them? I, I don't know that we're going to get to both pieces necessarily unless we just do spots in the pieces. Listen, I, I, can, I, I don't have to start at the beginning. I've got it worked out so that we can start a couple lines down or whatever. We can do parts of what I'm doing. Okay. See what I'm so, doing? Yeah. So if you have anything that you want to ask me about or want my opinion about interpretively, then feel free to pose that right at the start. Yes. Yes. Um, um, the, the, uh, the first part of the uh, Schumann, the, the last, I'm going to play just the one page or part of the one page. Um, the, the coda... Uh, I, I, want, I want to make sure that I've got the right um, mood about it. It, it, it isn't just a long song, and it's, and it's uh, to me, it's kind of a, just almost like Flora. It's uh, yeah. just a, a sort of a dream at the end of the piece. And I, and I, hope, and I hope that's right. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it, so that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. my, Yes, I mean the coda, coda in, in, in Schumann is often it's a summation of everything that you know. He and it, they tend to be very poetic and very profound, you know. Um, yeah. and, and most the most important section of the piece, you know. So I, I agree that these last three lines are the emotional core of the piece. So why don't you play? Let's hear what let's yeah. hear let's hear what you got. What I'm going to do is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to start this off at the page that you have in front of you. I'm going to start on the, the middle of the second line, which is a reiteration of the um, uh, first one, the first parts of the piece, and then I'll go into the third. <clears throat> okay, just a little bit of the previous section because we are, yeah, we're running a little short. Yeah.
Bravo, beautifully played. So yeah, so what a beautiful demonstration of some of the things that I've been talking about. Um, so just to point out the things that, that I, I, you know, I loved the tone. You know, she had a kind of a golden tone on top, your long notes. And then you, and then you were less. I loved so so that was that was really beautiful listening yeah and yeah beautiful sound your inner voices too everybody do you hear how she really kept the uh it wasn't you didn't do that obviously yeah so she really <laughs> layered she layered her sounds that, that we had the golden melody and then we had this murmuring below yeah um, so there was kind of a feeling of ebb and uh, ebb and flow that it is is so so important and yeah, it was really, really beautifully done. You know, you could possibly do it more reflectively, maybe a little slower. So. You know, it's harder, but oh. I think you try. Oh, have, right. you, have you tried it? Should I try, or should we go on? No, I'm saying, have, have you tried the slower tempo? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. What, what is the metronome marking? What's, what is the metronome marking? Because uh, uh, the copy I have, it's kind of blurred. It's 58. 58, okay. For, um, for, for the half note. So that's pretty, that is pretty fast. For a half note. Yeah. Yeah. So you, for a half note, though. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that, that's. You want me to learn? So 50. Is, uh, yeah, I think you could even go a little slower if you want. You know, I, I mean, it's your it's your moment. Uh, uh, you know, to to just it's like total Schumann puppy dog eyes. I love you. I love you so much. That's what he's saying. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. But that's what Schumann is. You know, it's just like this total heart. Yeah. It's total heart. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's and 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 so that's what I think. You know, if it's It's lovely, but you, you know, yeah. I love what you do here. But yeah, so you, you just really feel that this so so much like a singer, the time that you take for that that long that that stretch up to the A. I would suggest on a because you're going you're doing da 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 da, so those those uh, or not eighth notes, and you might think about 
yum, ba 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 ba, longer on the first note, and then moving through so it doesn't sound quite so square. That was the only place that I, I, I that I heard that. Yeah, so so that would be that would be a suggestion okay. that, that I would have. Okay. Um, I would say at the end, Mary Jack, I think you could take yet more time and let it expire more at the end. And by the way, Bravo, um, where it has retard, and then you, and then you went a tempo at the D minor after the first retard, two measures. That's totally what one needs to do. Schumann was notorious about not putting our tempos in after retards. It doesn't mean it just keeps getting slower and slower and slower. So that's a stylistic thing that we have to be aware of. And you, of course, completely did that correctly. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. And, uh, but at the very end, and I loved how you, you were softer from the A to the G, but uh, yeah. But I would actually a little longer. I would really just cool. take a ton of time there. Why not? It's the I would, and I would delay that last note. But it's like the last shining moment. You know, it's just, it's like the final benediction. It's it's so poetic. It's, I'm, I'm getting all verklempt here. <laughs> but it really is after all of, all of the, and then one more, five, one. But he, it's like, yeah, it is, it's a benediction. And then he, Slow pedal release. I, I have to say that gives me, that gives me lots of courage. Thank you. It gives me courage. Oh, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Well, that's what we want. But bravo, it's, it's beautiful playing. And, and this is what I had hoped for, that you would demonstrate some of these things, but show us how they work <laughs> in real music. You know, the idea of the of the flow of the accompaniments, of playing the accompaniments much softer, of the beautiful tone, of the listening, you know, from the long notes matching, all that, all that stuff, you know, the flexibility, uh, all that is, is, is wonderful. So I would say, you know, we've got, yeah. we could probably have a few questions to wrap up. Um, I, you know, we don't really need the Chopin. This was great. <laughs> I think this was a great way uh, to, to end it. So, so thank you, thank you. Does anyone have anything that they want to comment on or have questions? Anything? I mean, I see some nice things. Thank you for your nice comments in the in the chat. Um, uh, thank you, Karen, for mentioning about the edition Megumi uses about the uh, the Clementi. Yeah, mine says mine is a cut time. So, but thanks for bringing that up. Anyone? Um, some one of the members asked, um, "Is the freeing the oh, caged bird, bird available online? I is it available I, online?" I don't know. Okay, I, I do not that. know. Um, but if you look it right. up, you can, right. if you Google freeing the caged bird, it will come up and then you should probably see resources. Okay. Great, thanks. Yes, yes, absolutely. So good, good, good question. Um, Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would just like to say that was an excellent presentation. I have been to so many of these and I learned a lot and I appreciated it. And I thought the players did a great job. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Well, we certainly appreciate your work with us.
Tommy, oh. I really appreciate your time and all of your preparation. Oh, and thank you. Thank phone you. Calls and, and everything say, else. I have to give a big shout out to Roseanne, um, who has, was tireless in her dedication to making this happen and, you know, getting music aligned and getting performers and videos. And thank you also to Susan for, for making this happen. I am not good with technology, uh, but I'm really encouraged because, you know, I think we made it work. You know, and yes. and so I'm I'm really really glad for that. Um, I just I do want to mention if anyone is interested, I do coachings online. Yeah, so you can get a group of people together and and split a session. You can have your students play for me. I mean, I work with people on a regular basis. I do it on an occasional basis, um, but I, I love doing this kind of thing. And I have worked with numerous teachers who just want to build their skills, you know, and be better pianists, but also better teachers, because the more that you can bring to the table in terms of your knowledge and your skill set, as in terms of technical and musical aspects, then the better it is all around, but it, it definitely for your, for, your, for your students. So just wanted to let you know that. Um, and this, yeah, it was, it was, this was really fun. And uh, yeah, I, as I say, I'm encouraged that the format is, is possible because I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know how this is going to be. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate this, Tommy. And go have breakfast. Oh, I, I, oh, I had, no, I had breakfast. I oh, you did, breakfast. okay. I just had it earlier, like an hour or so earlier. Everything was earlier <laughs> than, than my, yeah, my normal time. You know, so and I'll send yeah. out your contact information to all the teachers. So yes, fan fantastic. So and thank you again to everybody who. Thank you, up. Susan. Yeah, of course. I want to give a shout out to the Oregon Community Foundation, whose funding made this possible. And I will be putting the recording of this up on the OMTA YouTube channel in a few days. I'll let Roseanne know so she can let you know. Oh wow! Okay, great. Thank awesome. All right. all right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Good to see you. Okay, I guess we're going to leave. How do you get out of this thing?